So open your Bibles today to guess where. Can anybody guess where we're going to be today? The book of Psalms. All right. I love y'all. Y'all know where we are. Uh, we're in Psalm 119 today. For our regulars in the room, you probably have this chapter marked in your Bible by now because we've been studying Psalm 119 for a little over a month. Psalm 119 is so rich in revealing to us the heart of a person who loves Scripture, who relishes more for the, the Lord in their lives than, than themselves, that they want the Lord God's way. They want the commands of the Lord. They want more of God and, and less of them. So as we read chapter 119, we t- continually get that theme over and over again, a person who loves Scripture. But you can't read this and not say to yourself, most people don't sound like this. Most people don't sound like the psalmist in 119. Most people aren't living their lives with a reverence and an awe towards the Word of God. Well, you're right. In fact, if that is your observation, you are absolutely spot on. We live in a, in a broken world. We are sinful people. See, the desires of our heart are to pursue sin, self-indulgence, and to live how we please. The Christian, however, the old has passed away and the new has come. We've been given a new heart, a new desire, and a new passion for the Word of God. And I hope this morning that that describes you. I hope that you are the person who desires more of God and and less of you. That you love the Lord God with everything that you have. That you love His Word and you love His ways. You know, people ask me the question a lot. How can I know that I'm truly following the Lord? Well, I think there's a a simple answer to that question. Is, Is there a difference in your life of how you used to live? And how you see the Holy Spirit changing your life every single day making true the fruits of God's Spirit, the fruits of the Holy Spirit, evident in your life every day, looking at who you used to be versus the person that you are today because of God's saving grace in your life. As we read chapter 119, this has been one of those studies where you cannot help but assess your life compared to the psalmist here and seeing if you have the same desires of wanting to know the Lord better, loving His Word, and centering your life around the gospel. Today we land in verses 73 through 80. And as I read this to you, open your heart and open your ears to what this has to say. And I want you to see and I want you to think about, do I have these same desires in my heart? Do I have the same desires that the psalmist speaks of today? And the title of the message is Godly Knowledge and Godly Truth. Listen to what it says. It says, For your hands have made and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Those who fear you, fear you shall see me and rejoice, because I have hoped in your word. I know, O Lord, that your rules are righteous, and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Let your steadfast love comfort me according to your promise to your servant. Let your mercy come to me that I may live, for your law is my delight. Let the insolent be put to shame, because they have wronged me with falsehood. As for me, I will meditate on your precepts. Let those who fear you turn to me, that they may know your testimonies. May my heart be blameless in your statues, that I may not be put to shame. An absolute beautiful text today from the psalmist, and a complete dependence here exercised upon the Lord. A hope that's only found in the Word of God. And then we read a little bit here this morning about having the right attitude towards those who hurt us. Well, let's jump in and let's talk about it some more. I want you to keep your Bibles out, and we're going to walk through each verse uh, together this morning in this message. Starting with verse 73, the psalmist here begins by proclaiming the Lord God is the creator of us. Not only is he the creator, God has given us exactly what you need and exactly what I need, and that is his spoken word to us through the Holy Scriptures. I talked a few weeks ago on Father's Day about how I had a fear and anxiety of bringing my kids into a broken and a sinful world. You know, seeing my children born into sin. You know, being a parent, you hate to see your kids exposed to the brokenness of this world. Well, the fact is, is we are all born into sin. And that sinful nature is there with us at birth. Well, because of sin, we are born broken and in need of help and need of a Savior. Yeah, we pause to think about the fact that the Lord's hand formed us and made us. And that's certainly amazing to stop and think about. But it's also amazing to wrap your mind around and understand that the Lord also knows what is best for us as as well. And He has given us His Word. 
What we need is what the psalmist desires here and says is, Lord, give me an understanding. Give me understanding to understand your commands. Lord, give me a better understanding of your way. I want to pause for a second. I just want to ask you the simple question. Do you ever pray that in your prayer time? Lord, give me a better understanding of your word. Lord, I I want to understand your ways. I want to know what you have to say. I want to know what's right and I want to know what's wrong according to your word because I know that my way is totally whack. I I know that my way is totally wrong. See, this is a request of dependence and it's a request of trust. It's setting our selfish nature to the side and fully and wholeheartedly relying upon the word of God for everything in our lives. You know, I can't say it enough in Psalm 119 repeats it over and over again. Lord, give us a love for your word. Lord, give us a passion for your word in my, in my life. I tell you all the time, but I feel like I need to say it over and over again too. As your pastor here at City Soul Ministries, my greatest desire is to see a church here that loves scripture. Every single last one of us on fire for the word of God. And I see so many of you here today that have been radically changed by your personal study in the Word of God and radically changed by the preaching and the teaching of God's Word here at this church. As we move on and shift gears into to verse 74, let's read it again. It says, Those who fear you shall see me and rejoice because I have hoped in your Word. This is a very interesting thing that the psalmist says here. Very interesting and helps us understand that the psalmist is confident that those who also fear the Lord, love the Lord, will rejoice when they see Him. You know, I love to to celebrate, and and I know that you do as well. There's something special about celebrating. A birthday party, a graduation, an anniversary, some sort of accomplishment. We love that. In fact, we love to celebrate as humans. But do you understand that we often rejoice And we often celebrate in our society today for all the wrong things, specifically sin. I don't really even need to go down this path this morning, but we certainly live in a world where we elevate and push up and celebrate sinful things. We celebrate and we push sinful agendas in our society today while we reject and we suppress the truth of God's word. While we reject and suppress that which is righteousness, and that is pursuing the Lord in our lives. You know, there's something special, something incredible about celebrating with other believers, is there not? Coming together on Sunday mornings and celebrating what Jesus has done for us. Many of you in this church have come to a a faith alone in Christ alone, and the change in your life is beyond words. As a pastor, rejoicing in that is What keeps me going on the days that are tough? Seeing the Lord capture your heart, change your life, flip your world upside down is better than any other experience, any other celebration that we could ever have in this life. As Christians, we in in essence trade in our rejoicing for sinful things. We trade those in now for godly things. And we rejoice with those who come to salvation and have a new passion and reverence for the Lord God and for His spoken word. Let me, let me say this to you, and I want you to listen very carefully to what I'm about to say. When other people see you or talk to you, do they rejoice in your sin? Or do they rejoice in the change that the Lord has made in your life? Do you promote and live for the ways of the Lord? Or do you promote and live for the way of sin? That is a very serious thought for us to think about today. Assessing our own personal lives and how other people see us and see our faith. And is our faith evident? Are people celebrating with us for the right reasons? Are they celebrating the Lord God? Are they celebrating Scripture? Are they celebrating sanctification? Are they celebrating the change that the Lord has made in our lives? Or are we promoting and celebrating that which is sinful? Serious question for all of us to face this morning. Moving on to verse 75, it says, I know, O Lord, that your rules are righteous, and in faithfulness you have afflicted me. So this uh, first speaks, this speaks first of of a confidence and an understanding that the laws and the way of God are the only right way for people. Understanding that my ways are not good. But then it says something a little confusing here, that you have afflicted me, that you have afflicted me. What exactly can we take away from this? 
Well, as you and I study Scripture more, we begin to see and understand that sometimes afflictions in our lives can be directed and traced right back to a direct consequence of a sinful choice that we made in our lives. The Lord simply can use those difficult times and those afflictions to purge us, to grow us, and to sanctify us. But there are also other instances in our lives, other instances in Scripture, for example, where we see godly people, where they can experience affliction and struggle for unknown reasons. There's really not a a finger-pointing reason of why they're going through the struggles in their life. I think that in our minds as Christians, Job comes to mind in the Old Testament. Joseph would probably be another example. But Jesus is the perfect example. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8, it tells us this, that Jesus learned obedience through what He suffered. Jesus learned obedience through what He suffered. Let me just give you the bottom line here. Just because this morning you fear God, you love God, you serve God, and are saved in, in your faith alone in Christ alone, does not mean that you will live a life that's free of affliction, of struggle, of hurt, and of pain. While I am saved of my sin, while I have been counted righteous through my faith alone in Christ alone, I still live in a broken, sinful world. My sin still affects me to this day. And sometimes other people's sin will affect me as well. Sometimes I can trace my sin back or my, my, my consequences back to a specific sinful choice, while other times I can't. But the peace that we have as Christians is knowing that only righteousness, only righteousness in the sight of our Heavenly Father, and only right living is found in Christ and found in living in Him. That restoring our broken relationship with God is only in Him. And when my faith alone is in Christ alone, understand that no one can take that from you. No one can take that faith from you. As we read along here in verse 76, the psalmist speaks of comfort and where comfort is truly found. Verse 76 says, Let your steadfast love comfort me according to your promise to your servant. What is this steadfast, unfailing love? How do we define that? How do we define and wrap our minds around this unfailing love? Well, unfailing love is love that endures forever. It is a great love that our minds fully can't even grasp. It's a love that would lay down its life for one's friends, as Jesus did. As you and I walk through struggle as we deal with the afflictions in our lives, as we struggle and wrestle with sin and the consequences of our sin and the unknown consequences of our sin, and we live our lives, comfort is only found every single time in our Heavenly Father. See, I don't need to tell you this today because we all know this, but the comfort that this world has to offer you is temporary. Alcohol is just temporary. A high from drugs is just temporary. Relationships are just temporary. But the Lord God lasts forever and His Word lasts forever. So what we need to do, church, is we need to stop focusing on the temporary. We need to stop focusing our lives on the things that we see with our eyes and fix our eyes upon our Heavenly Father. You can't put a band-aid on your sin. You can't just slap a band-aid on it and say, I'm good to go. God's just going to let me in one day whenever I take my final breath and I stand before Him. Sin is that which has separated us from a holy God. The unfailing love that God has shown us is sending His only Son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins, for the sins of His people. And today I just simply ask you, do you find your comfort in that? Or are you still trying to find your comfort Drugs, or alcohol, or relationships, or pleasure, or fill in the blank, the ways of this world. Well, not only is the Lord our comfort, He is what verse 77 tells us, and listen to it again. It says, let your mercy come to me that I may live, for your law is my delight. As we look at this word mercy, and maybe your version says compassion, I'm not sure, but um understanding and trying to wrap our minds around the Lord's mercy and compassion. I think to to better understand it, let me give you the definition of mercy. Mercy is defined like this. It's compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish 
or to harm. Do you even realize this morning what we deserve? Do you even understand this morning what we deserve for our sin, for our brokenness, for our sinful nature? To wrap our minds around the mercy of God, the compassion and the love of God, should drive you to your knees every single day. We deserve the punishment for our sins. We deserve all the harm for our sins. But through the finished work of Jesus Christ upon the cross, dying for our sins, we can now be forgiven. I can't even begin to say how thankful I am to wrap my mind around and to embrace God's mercy and love in my life. I owe Him everything. I owe Him my life. I owe Him my service. I owe Him everything. I want to tell the world of His love. I want to live my life according to His commands. Once again, the result here for the person who receives salvation through Jesus Christ and experiences the compassion of God is what the psalmist talks about. And that is that the law of God, the word of God, the precepts of God, the commands of God, the word of God now becomes your joy and now becomes your delight. Last week, we talked about freedom and how freedom is truly found in submission to the Lord and submission to His Word and submission to His will and submission to His way. Next in verse 78, it says, Let the insolent be put to shame because they have wronged me with falsehood. As for me, I will meditate on your precepts. We may not understand what the word insolent means, but let me explain it to you. We read here that the psalmist must have dealt with some sort of pain or affliction caused by somebody else's harsh words or harsh, harsh actions towards them. And I was reading that this week, and I know that you can certainly relate, right? Somebody that said something hurtful to you, somebody that spread gossip or spread a lie about you, it's devastating, it's hurtful, and it's just flat out wrong. Here the psalmist speaks about our focus. I want to talk to you about focus for just a moment. Here's the truth. No matter what people say about you, no matter what lies they spread, no matter what gossip is going on behind the scenes, we need to have our focus this morning in check. Will you choose to focus upon the lies? Will you choose to allow your life to be defined by what other people are saying about you? Or will you do what the psalmist does here and says, you know what? I'm not going to worry about what everybody else says. I'm not going to worry about the lies. I'm going to meditate and I'm going to focus upon the Lord's word. Do you really care about what other people have to say about you more than what you care about what the Lord has to say to you in his word? You know, if I live my life in uh, high school mode forever or middle school mode forever, trying to please everybody, trying to fit in with the crowd, trying to, to, to win the acceptance of other people, I will never be happy. I will spend my life constantly worried about, well, what's, what's so-and-so saying about me? How do they think of me? What do they think about this today? I will spend my life worried about what other people think and say about me. While we study Scripture and allow Scripture to be everything to us, we get to know the Lord God. We get to know and understand His holiness his love, His character, His commands, and His purpose for His people. We begin to delight in Him, experience our salvation in Him, live according to His Word, and experience an indescribable amount of peace. As we somewhat kind of come to a close today, in the last couple of verses, in verses 79 through 80, there's something very important here that I don't want you to miss. Let's read verses 79 through 80 again. It says, Let those who fear you turn to me that they may know your testimonies. May my heart be blameless in your statues, that I may not be put to shame. Let me read to you some beautiful commentary on these verses. I love this this week, and I just want to read it to you. It says, The psalmist knows that our Creator will finally honor Him for loving and keeping His commandments. But even more so, the psalmist sees that his affliction and his prayers for the Lord to grant him understanding will finally enable him to help others in knowing the ways and the testimonies of the Lord. In other words, if you're not following that morning, let me explain it to you. There's a purpose behind our struggles. There's a purpose behind our afflictions, behind our prayers, behind our searching and studying Scripture. Our desire to know the Lord God better is also an incredible effort to show other people the truth 
of who the Lord God is. It's an effort to show other people the love and the word and the truth of God's word. So what should be the greatest desire of the heart of the person who loves the Lord God? Well, first of all, you got to love the Lord God with everything you have, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Then it's to take that godly life, that study in scripture that you have, that sermon that you heard at church on Sunday morning, that depositing the word of God. Now it's to take it and to show other people the truth of who the Lord God is. You know, so many people in the church today, and I say that as a whole, the church around the world, the Christian church today, is we don't really have a heart for the lost. I mean, we do. We say we do, but we don't really show it. We want to love God, and we know that's important. But the reason why you study Scripture, the reason why we come to church, the reason why we deposit the Word of God into our lives is not just for us. It's not just to puff ourselves up with biblical knowledge. Here's the bottom line. It's to glorify God. Everything that we do is to glorify God. We glorify God by doing everything that we do for Him. We study the Scripture to know Him better. We know Scripture so that we can uh, glorify God in our lifestyles. That lifestyle of godliness then shows other people, directs people, and shows them the love of God, thus glorifying God in the process. You see how that works? See, when you study Scripture, it's not just for you. It is for you, but it's also so that you can deposit the Word of God into your life. And so that you can magnify and glorify the Lord God in your life because you now know what the Word of God says. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing. You know, I don't um, I don't preach to glorify myself. Trust me, I'm a nobody. I'm a sinner that needs God's grace just as much as you do. I preach so that the Word of God can be advanced in this church and the lives of the people that are here every weekend as we gather. And that's the reason why we gather, is to study and to lift high and to glorify the Word of God. The depositing of God's Word into our lives should result in a life change. And that life change should be what this community and what these uh, co-workers that you have see in your life. And then it's coming together as the church, the body of Christ, and glorifying God. I want to ask you in closing today, do you desire what the psalmist desires here? A life that reflects the glory of God. A life that points people to the truth of God's word. A life that does everything, says everything to the glory of God.